All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, this is the science review, uh, which uh, you guys have to endure every year. Um, but this year, it's going to be a little bit different. So uh, as you are aware, the SSC readings requirement has been dropped, which is a long story. We're continuing to look at um, our CE options for the future, but for now, this is the CE, and auditing the seminar is CE, and the stuff that you get online is a CE, but there's no testing requirement. So this, this is the science review. Um, we continue to believe that a starting strength coach should be able to look at an exercise science paper and separate you know, what's useful from what's bullshit. Um, and um, that's part of what this exercise is about, particularly today. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. Uh, Rip asked me, instead of the, the usual approach where we take a lot of papers and, and I give you a critique of, of these papers and what we can get out of them as coaches, instead, we're going to take just a few papers and actually it's going to turn out to be just one or two and, and do a deep dive on them and kind of reinforce the approach that we talked about at the first meeting uh, to reading uh, an exercise science paper, which is just one approach that we can use, um, but one that I have found to be particularly useful in my career. So it's a, we're, we're, gonna do, we're gonna do a deep dive. We're gonna go in, right, and, and take a real close look, a real close look at what's going on, right? It won't, won't hurt a bit. So the, the consequence of this is, is that instead of like going from one paper to another sort of rapid fire, uh, this lecture you might find to be a bit more dry than what you're used to for the science presentation, but we'll make it as engaging as we can, right? So let's review the process of how we like to look at an exercise science paper. We start with the title, right? So in my opinion, a good title is one that says, you know, squats make you stronger. It's a declarative statement of what the authors think they found, right? Whereas a title that says like, studies of the squat and strength doesn't really tell you what the authors think they found. It's just sort of a blase anodyne statement. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have to dig in a little bit deeper to get an idea of what it is the authors think they concluded. And a title that has a question mark in it, does the squat make us stronger? Right, that just pisses me off, right? It, it's like, well, if you don't know, why should I read your paper, right, is kind of thing. They're trying to draw you into the paper with like, with a question mark, right? I, I, that kind of irritates me. So in my opinion, the best title is one that is declarative and a clear statement of what it is that the authors think they found, if anything. Then one moves on to the abstract. And the abstract should be a pretty clear capsule summary of what is going on in the paper. There should be at least an implicit hypothesis or study question that you're able to get out of the abstract and its overall context and relevance and how the authors approached the problem experimentally. What was their experimental model, right? What their findings were and what they concluded, if anything, from those findings. So the abstract is, is the reader's digest form of the paper. You should be able to read the abstract and have a pretty clear idea of what the authors think they did and what they think they found. The abstract being, of course, the most that almost 99.9% .9 of the people who ever encounter the paper will ever read. We're gonna learn how to dig a little bit deeper into it and the way we do that is next. We go directly to the data to the figures and tables. We skip the introduction. I skip the introduction. I skip the methods. I skip the methods because I already have the abstract. I already know what the research question is. I already have a, I should from the, from the abstract have a pretty good idea of what the experimental model was, how they set up the experiment, right? So I should be able to go and just look at the data and have a pretty good idea of what the data says. And I want to look at the data before the authors have a chance to massage me and influence me 
and sort of program me to look at the data in a particular way. I want to look at the data as raw as I can get it, which is the figures and tables. Does that make sense? And that can be a little bit tough, right? But it's, it, it's a really big payoff step. Then I go back to the introduction. The introduction is, has two primary areas of usefulness. The first one is that the, intro, the introduction gives you an idea of the context of the, of the, of the research question that the authors were addressing. And um, it also serves often as a kind of review of the topic. This is what other people have found about this. This is why the area is of interest and relevance to us. Uh, this is the outstanding question or questions in the area. And so we chose to address it. That's what the introduction tells you. By the time you finish reading the introduction, you should have a pretty clear idea explicitly of what the research hypothesis was. Right? If you haven't gotten an idea from the abstract, you, sh you should have a pretty clear idea after looking at the data and the introduction. If you still don't have a clear idea of what the research hypothesis is, you may not have a very good paper in your hands. The methods is where the rubber meets the road. The rubber meets the road. Now remember, you've already seen the data, right? You've already looked at the figures and tables. So by now, if you've looked at the figures and tables in any depth, you should have a bunch of questions in your mind. Well, where did they, how did they get that data, right? And why did they do this and not that, right? And so you should have some lingering questions in your mind about how they actually got the data. And the method section will answer that. And you're going to look very closely at the method section because that's where most of the papers fall down. That's where the shortcomings of the paper will be. Not in the statistical analysis, and we'll talk about that later. I mean, you can screw up a good paper with a bad statistical analysis, but there's a tendency for people to focus really heavy on the statistical methods that were used to analyze the data. And that's not really the strength or weakness of most scientific papers. The strength or weakness of most scientific papers lies in their experimental design, right? Did the experimental design actually address the research question in play? Then finally, you look at the results section, where the authors report the results that they found and which you have already looked at because you jumped straight to the figures and tables. Right? You've already seen the data, and now you've read the methods. So now you can read the results and any spin that the authors put on it. And because you've read the methods, at this point, you'll also notice something like, well, they looked at this. Right? They looked at, like say they looked at diet, or they looked at uh, a particular parameter, but they're not really reporting it in the results. In the methods, they say they looked at this and they looked at that, but I never saw that in the data, and I'm not seeing it in the results. Why is that? Which is a really good question to ask. Ask yourself, as the authors present the data to you, is the presentation of the data clear? Is it plausible? Is there really a difference, or is there really no difference, depending on what the authors are reporting, when you look at the data and you look at the reported results? And then finally, the discussion, again, can be useful because what they'll do is they'll give you another mini review of the literature and tell you where the field is at, and that can lead you to further readings on the topic if you're interested in it. And then it's also another opportunity for the authors to put their own spin on the data and to wave their hands around a little bit, right? Uh, but by now, you're fairly uh, well inoculated against that because you've looked critically at the data and you've looked critically at the methods and the statistical analysis and the results. Does that all make sense to everybody? And then finally, the conclusions. So, are the conclusions supported by the data? Are the conclusions contradicted by the data? This happens, right? So, one of the things that you will see is a paper where you look at the data and you say, well, I can use it to support 
this hypothesis, but I can also use it to support another hypothesis where the interpretation of the data is a little bit fuzzy. You can look at it in a couple of different ways. Or occasionally you'll find a paper where the conclusion of the authors is actually contradicted by their own data. They'll find one thing and they'll say, yeah, actually, if you're as smart as us, you know that it's really the opposite of what we're showing you in the data. I'm serious. You'll see that, right? And then sometimes they'll break out the practical implications of the data in a separate section. JSCR does that, I think, where they break it out into the practical application of the data. Uh, and in a lot of journals, it's just included in the conclusions. So ask yourself, what are the real practical implications? And you should be asking yourself, how does this affect my coaching or training practice? Right? How does this affect what I do? You know, do the efforts of the authors leave you convinced? I mean, at the end of the day, are you convinced? Or are you skeptical? Are you, you know, uh, pissed off? Filled with pity? Uh, you know, so ask yourself, what are, what are your conclusions from the data that you see. Any questions about this process? And again, it's, it's just a process that I have found works really well for me and has helped keep me out of trouble reading medical literature, exercise science literature, scientific literature in general. Any questions about this process? This is sort of the process that we, that we advocate um, as a, an association in our article on how to read the literature in the library. Okay. That all being said, we are going to spend most of our time in this section of uh, this morning's presentation looking at um, this paper, the impact of the back squat and leg press exercises on maximal strength and speed strength parameters, published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research in 2013. The first author is Wirth. The second, heart, uh, the second author is our friend Hagen Hartmann. Uh, and it looks like the senior author was Kiner. Um, Hagen Hartmann has published some really great results. We're in, we're in sort of communication with him. Uh, I kind of think of him as a buddy. Um, but we are going to take a dispassionate look at this recent effort from his group. And uh, we're going to find some things that are good about it. And we're going to find some things that are not so good about it, by, as we would with any paper. Before we go any further, I want an honest show of hands. Nobody's going to be mad at you. We know you're all busy people. Who did not read the paper? Raise your hands. Raise them high. You're busy people. We understand that. Raise your hands high. OK, good. And uh, who read the paper in depth? Raise your hands. Yeah, fewer hands there. OK, I get it. So this is your opportunity to take a deep dive into the paper. And what we're going to do is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the abstract and some of the other sections. But when we, take, when we, when we jump to the data, the tables and the data, I'm going to ask some of you, particularly some of you who did not read the paper, to stand up and help us interpret the data. And it's going to be cool. It's going to be all right. Trust me. It won't hurt a bit. OK? So all that being said, let's move forward. Here's the abstract. Strength training induced increases in speed strength seem indisputable. And that's partly due to Hartmann's own work. Therefore, this study determined how the selection of training exercise influences the development of speed strength power and maximum strength during an eight-week training intervention. So there's an implicit hypothesis there, isn't there? We're starting to get a big and fuzzy idea of what the implicit hypothesis of the study was. Now, this sort of summarizes what the authors tell us in the abstract about their research design. They took 78 students, 78 students, young students, and I don't show you here in the interest of not cluttering up the slide, but they did a pretest, squat jump, counter movement jump, drop jump. And then they randomized the students, or they allocated the students, into two major groups. A training group of 39, and a control group of 39. And then both of those groups, the training group and the control group, were again subdivided 
again, we're not sure how yet based on the abstract, into a squat group and a leg press group. So there was a squat press and a leg press group and a control squat group and control leg press group. Okay. The training group had an eight week training intervention. The control group did not. And at the end of the intervention, a repeat test of the squat jump, counter movement jump, and drop jump was performed. The authors say they did a two factorial analysis of variance using a repeated measures model for all group comparisons and comparisons between pretest and post test results. Now, those of you who don't read the literature very often, your eyes just sort of glaze over at that point. I read the literature all the time and my eyes just sort of glaze over at that point, right? Because that's actually not that interesting to me. What's interesting to me is whether or not this design addresses the research problem, and we're gonna emphasize that over and over again. And finally in the abstract, the authors tell us this is what they found, right? In the squat jump measurement, the squat jump outcome, the squat outperformed the leg press. 12.4% increase, versus a 3.5% increase that was statistically significant, hence the asterisk. In the counter movement jump, the squat group outperformed the leg press group, again, by about, with an increase of about 12%. And again, it was statistically significant. And then the authors say there were indications, we were talking about square coat, square quotes earlier. There were indications that the squat outperformed the leg press, but they don't give us any numbers in the abstract for that. And the abstract concludes with the author saying, therefore, the squat exercise increased the performance in squat jump, counter movement jump, and reactive strength index. Hmm, what's that? So we're already starting to get some questions in our mind about how this study was done. Reactive strength index more effectively compared with the leg press in a short-term <coughs> intervention. Consequently, if the strength training aims at improving jump performance, the squat should be preferred because of the better transfer effects. Okay, so now we've looked at the abstract. So we pause and we ask ourselves, do I want to keep reading this? What's the answer? Do we want to keep reading this? Yes. Yeah, we do. This seems relevant and of interest to us as strength and conditioning pro professionals because what seems to be going on here? What seems to be going on is they're, they're saying, well, we know that strength has an impact on power. We know that strength has an impact on what they're calling speed strength performance and speed strength performance is important in all fields of athletic endeavor. But what these guys seem to be doing is they're saying, well, maybe the strength exercise that you choose to get stronger has a differential impact on the development of these speed strength parameters. And we're gonna see if one exercise is better than the other exercise. And so we can start to think about um, what was the hypothesis and what was the alternative hypothesis. A minute here. I, got a, I took a bunch of verbiage out of my PowerPoint presentation to keep Campitelli happy. I, and I bet he won't even say thank you or anything. <laughs> so we can start to think about what the hypothesis was, right? The hypothesis would be what? Would anybody care to formulate the hypothesis? Would anybody care to say what they think? the implicit hypothesis is in the abstract? Would, would anybody care to volunteer Emily Sokolinsky? <laughs> what, was, what was the hypothesis? What was the implicit hypothesis? The squat is better than the leg press. What? The squat is better than the leg press. Yeah, I think I, think I, would, I would state that the implicit, the implicit hypothesis here was that there is a differential effect of different strength training exercises on the development of speed strength parameters, right? That would be what? That would be the alternative hypothesis. That's what we call the alternative hypothesis. Alternative to what? Anybody? What? No. To the null hypothesis. 
The null hypothesis implicit in this abstract from all that we've read so far would be that different strength exercises have no differential effect on the development of speed strength parameters. That would be the null hypothesis. And this gets us to the issue of the sort of scientific methodological model that has dominated research for about the last century, the null hypothesis statistical testing model of science. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So now we have a good idea in our mind, though, of the null hypothesis, no effect, no differential effect of different exercises on power development, and the alternative hypothesis, which is that there is an effect. OK? All right. Moving forward, we are going to jump to the data here with table one. Would somebody like to help us interpret table one? Nick, stand up. Stand up. Yeah, you. Yeah, you <laughs> got a negative. Nick. It's just a summary of, of the, the data points, all the data that was collected. We've got the control group, the squad group, the lake. This is not a summary of all the data that was collected. Well, the, the group, the people. Right. So what is it telling us? Why is it here? Go ahead, stand up. It's just data about the participants. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is telling us about the subjects of the study. Right? All it is is, is, is telling us this is, what, this is what the subjects of the study look like. Why is it here? Yeah, we understand you took a bunch of bros and divided them into groups. Why are they giving us this data? CJ, stand up. Because if there are differences in the study populations, it may change whether it's relevant to your, your training and your population that you're working with in the world and between groups. And between groups. So it may not only affect the, the practical consequences of the results, but it may actually affect the study itself, right? That all being said, what do you think about these groups? Is there anything that jumps out at you? Carl, stand up. There's more bros in the squat group. There's more bros in the squat group. Yes, there are. 13 bros versus six babes. God, this is going to be this is going to be like on the internet. So I'm, I'm this, is, this, is, this is bad. This is bad. There were 13 males and uh, six of the female persuasion in the squat group, right? The LP group was sort of like the inverse of that: 11 females and nine males. Anything else jump out at you guys? Yes, stand stand up. Control group's pretty big. Yeah, the control group is pretty big, and I, why is that? <laughs> why is the control group big? Stand up. Because they needed to have half of the control group be squat, half the control group be the control for the leg press, and match the numbers on the actual squat. Yeah, that would be, that would be the, the apparent, uh, that, that's what I would say, right? That's why they made the control group so big. Kind of seems like a waste of bodies, but I think that's why they did it. Anything else about this anthropometric data? Um, Brody, stand up. <laughs> uh, and this may be the fact that there are there are more bros in the squat than the uh, than as opposed to uh, babes. But I assume when you look at the weight and the height, there's quite a it's a lot higher for the squat group than it is for the other two. The squat group was heavier and taller, right? And we know from the literature that that has implications for performance, don't we? Right. So yeah, they were, they were heavier than, they were certainly heavier than the control group, and they were heavier than the leg press group as well, on average, on average. So when we look at table one, which tells us right, about the demographics and anthropometry of the subjects that were used in this study, are there any questions that you have? Is, are there any big questions that you have about how the authors sampled the population of interest. Yeah, I would like to see how they randomized, how they randomized the group and had such a big... So would I, right? I, I, I find that 
a little bit concerning that I, and it actually will get worse. Trust me on this. So the, yeah, go ahead. Stand up. One of the things that intrigued me was they said that the control group was weaker because they didn't want to stop because the. Yeah, we're going to get, that's, that's the, that's the part where I said it gets worse, right? And, and I was kind of like, oh, why did you do that? I have a more fundamental question and, you know, maybe I'm off base here. You guys can tell me. Why, why mix, especially because your groups were not that large, why mix male and females, right? We know that they have different performance characteristics, right? Why mix up males and females? Why not break them out into separate groups or do a study with just males or a study with just females? Hell, two papers in one, right? Why not, why, why would you mix it up like this? Carl, stand up. Uh, being suspicious, if I wanted to make a paper that made the squat look better, I might put more bros in the squat group. Yeah, I might too, if that's what I wanted to do. And I don't think that's how, we know this group, we know their work, right? I don't think that's how they do business, but it is, it is a little odd that they chose to sample the population this way, right? Because it, it, it has to decrease a little bit our confidence in the reliability of the results, in my opinion, right? So we've only look, we haven't actually looked at any of the research data yet, and we're already starting to have some questions, okay? Anything else on table one that anybody want, would like to add? Okay, let's move on to the next set of data, table two. Table two is entitled Isometric and Dynamic Maximum Strength Performance. Okay, anybody want to help us pick apart this table? Bill Bean, stand up. Oddly, I was seriously considering volunteering. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I, I want to find out what T1, T2, and then we can figure out what the percent, percent difference is, and I want to know what ES is. So down at the bottom it says T1 is the pretest, T2 is post-test, uh, control group is uh, uh, for the squat, control LP means control for leg press. Okay, uh -huh. so uh, with that kind of a background, we can go up here and see that Let's just take the one RM for the squat control group pre 73 plus or minus 25. All right, stop. So before you do that, all right, you're doing great, right? So you went to the legend. You're trying to figure out what, what you're looking at here, right? So what is, what are we looking at here in this first column? Oh, yeah, that'd be the methodology, right? I mean, that, what? Right, you're, you're, you're looking at, at, at the parameters that were measured, right? right? Right, so this is the one rep max, right, for the control squat, control LP, of the squat and the LP, the squat and the leg press, right? The control group and the squat and LP group. What is this, what is this here? Uh, it's the isometric, right? And so right away, are you asking yourself a question about this MIF? What is the question that you're asking yourself? How did they measure that, right? So that's something else to put in the back of our mind for when we get to the methodology, okay? And so now we have sort of a roadmap. It's pretty clear what they're doing here, right? They're telling us what these parameters were when they measured them before the intervention, and then what those parameters were when they measured them after the intervention, 